Hello everybody, I'm speaking um, from the Ragged Theatre at Geoscience Australia, so I'm both looking around the room but I also am looking to those that are online. Um, my name's Steve Hill, I'm the Chief Scientist at Geoscience Australia and I am really excited about today's seminar which we're really celebrating as part of Earth Science Week. Before I say any more about that though, I'd like to just have a brief acknowledgement of country um, and this is an interesting one because I know we're talking or speaking with and, and engaging people from all around. So um, Geoscience Australia acknowledges the traditional owners and custodians of country throughout Australia and acknowledge their continuing connection to the land, waters, sky and community. We pay our respects to the people, the cultures and the elders past, present and also looking into the future. Welcome to all of you for um, being here for today's seminar and as I mentioned earlier uh, it's Earth Science Week so have a happy Earth Science Week everybody. Uh, a little bit about Earth Science Week, it's held annually in October and it aims to increase the awareness of the importance of Earth Science which we all know it's important but it's a chance to really channel that and get it together um, and, and also the value that it brings to our everyday lives. It's an exciting opportunity to deepen our understanding of the world around us and to discover how earth science really is everywhere. Could there be any better seminar to have than the one we have today um, where Alison Rose will really take us into space so that we can gain a better understanding of how space-based capabilities are reshaping our relationship with our planet Earth. Alison Rose is the Chief of Geoscience Australia's Space Division, leading Australian Government positioning, navigation and timing. And I'm going to be a bit cool here, Alison, I'm going to call it PNT. <laughs> I know you guys love your acronyms for these things. As well as Earth Observation, EO, hey? How cool is that? Um, so, yeah, leading those programs. Prior to her appointment, Alison led the Place, Space and Communities Division at Geoscience Australia that, in addition to space, also included national mapping, marine and Antarctic science and community safety programs. Prior to this, Alison has held several senior executive positions within both the private and public sectors, in, including as Assistant Secretary for Border Intelligence Support to Operations at the Department of Home Affairs, Director of National Government Industry Solutions with ESRI. I think many of you know about ESRI, but for those that don't, ESRI is a US, United States based GIS technology company. Uh, Alison's also been part of delivery of the Department of Defence's corporate and geospatial ICT programs and projects and enterprise information management implementation. <laughs> <laughs> That's a lot of work just saying what you do. Imagine what the work was like. <laughs> and leadership of the Australian Geospatial Intelligent Organis Intelligence Organisations Foundation Mapping, Advanced Analytics, Training and Tradecraft, Data and Collection Management and Customer, customer Services. Fantastic background, fantastic speaker, someone who I know is passionate about the science of the earth so please join me in welcoming Alison Rose to provide us with her seminar today. Thank you, Alison. What a wonderful intro. Thanks so much for the kind words, Steve. Um, I'm really excited to be talking about Geoscience Australia's space-based data, science, capabilities, services, technologies during Earth Science Week. Um, so let's lift off into outer space. Um, I guess the presentation itself will be a little bit like a Star Wars trilogy, so it's going to have three parts. Um, the first part I'll talk about our Earth observation science, uh, really focusing on some of the use cases, but a little bit around the capability itself. I'll then move on to our precise positioning program, uh, and then I'd like to talk a little around how we actually bring these together. 
To start, I'd like to acknowledge the traditional owners of the custodian, uh, the custodians of the land that we're meeting on, the Ngunnawal people, um, and also extend that respect to uh, any First Nations peoples that are connected to country across the ACT region and, of course, across Australia. I'd just like to acknowledge that Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander peoples have been observing the skies for millennia as both a map and a guide to navigation, seasons and cultural practice. So I'd like to pay my respects to Elders past, present and emerging and extend that respect to any Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander peoples joining us today. Geoscience Australia's vision is to be a world leading organisation informing evidence based decisions through integrated earth sciences to secure Australia's future. Space-derived positioning, geodesy and earth observation constitute a major component of our scientific evidence base. As the lead Australian government organisation for operational civilian PNT, geodesy and satellite land and coast imaging, we deliver space-based capabilities for government, business, academia and the community to enable a prosperous economy, a sustainable environment and a resilient society. We do this through two multi-decadal space programs. The first, our Positioning Australia program, delivers decimeter accurate uh, and reliable positioning services, services across all of Australia. Um, we do that through a next generation satellite based augmentation system, that's a big word, it's called SBAS, um, which provides 10 centimetre services when it's fully operating and currently 37.5 uh, centimetre positioning services from space across all of Australia, including in regional and remote areas. Our second major project is our national positioning infrastructure capability, which combined with our open source analysis and software tools known as GINAN, we deliver three to five centimetre positioning services that are highly accurate and highly uh, reliable in all areas of mobile phone and internet coverage. And I just make a <coughs> note there, that's 96% of areas uh, that we have internet and mobile phone coverage, you can consume three to five centimetre services. Um, this is all underpinned by a really important aspect of our fundamental science here at Geoscience Australia. I'm not allowed to have a favourite, I'll leave it at that. It's called geodesy. Um, and geodesy is really around um, understanding and dynamically measuring and creating reference frames that define the shape, orientation um, and the gravity field of Earth. And why is that important? Well, if we don't understand where we are with respect to the Earth's centre, then three to five centimetre positioning services won't really work. And in fact, no location data has something to pin it on. And that's why geodesy is so important. Um, so we provide national geodetic reference frames and capabilities that dynamically measure uh, the shape, the orientation, the spin rate of our Earth. So a really important capability. And that's all tied up in our Positioning Australia program. Uh, the second program, our Digital Earth program, uh, provides continental scale, time series, satellite land and coast imaging data and derivative products over all of Australia and Africa. And now we're going to Antarctica, um, which is super exciting. Um, this is data since 1988, so it's full comprehensive science grade time series analysis of our landscape and our coast, uh, which is exciting. Uh, as a natural part of that, our digital earth program or part of our EO program actually extends to a regional data hub where we provide sentinel imagery uh, in Southeast Asia right through into the Pacific. Uh, and we are super delighted um, that our Earth Observation Program is moving to the next generation through the Australia-US partnership on Landsat Next. And I'm just going to talk a little about this on my next slide. The Australian Government has committed $207.4 million of new funding over the next four years with additional annual ongoing funding for our partnership with the US on their Next Generation Landsat Program. As Minister King announced in March this year, there are several lines of Australian effort and its full EO supply chain. 
So it starts with enhancing satellite ground station facilities in Alice Springs. We will have new advanced data processing and distribution capabilities, new scientific integrity monitoring and calibration capabilities, and excitingly, new science, new advanced analytic capabilities, including artificial intelligence and machine learning and predictive analytics. These capabilities represent a package that Geoscience Australia will deliver in exchange for a bilateral data guarantee to Landsat data, past, present and future. In terms of capability, this is where I get really excited, um, Landsat NASA is going to be a real step change. 10 metre resolution imaging of the entire Earth's surface every six days through a constellation of three satellites. So that's a really significant increase on 30 metre resolution available now every 8 to 16 days. And what's even more exciting is that there's going to be super close uh, calibration of sensors with Europe's Sentinel series of satellites. So that means that we can use Landsat imagery and Sentinel imagery together, which means that the whole of the Earth's surface will be imaged with science grade, deeply calibrated satellite imagery every one to three days. Importantly, there's also a significant leap in the spectral capabilities, up to 26 spectral bands from 11, so we're moving from multi to super spectral with the Landsat next, uh, next generation satellites. So what does all this mean? Um, we'll be able to monitor more elements of our landscape at increased resolution and more often with science grade Earth observation that tells us what is and has, has happened on lands and coasts over the last 50 years by the time it comes online in 2030. We'll be able to observe from space vegetation and crop health, plant stress, water quality, bushfires, soil quality, surface mineral composition, ice sheet movements and other essential variables, even penguin colonies in Antarctica, that's super exciting. Um, and when coupled with an already 50 plus year archive, it presents a multi-decadal time series dating back to the 80s. At the continental scale, where natural and human induced changes can be detected, differentiated, characterised and monitored over time. It truly is a step change in how we monitor, assess and re respond to changes on our lands and coasts. So with this future insight, um, I'll now turn to impact uh, by detailing how Earth observation currently supports our economy, environment and society. The economic potential of EO is undeniable. A collaborative report by the World Economic Forum and Deloitte released earlier this year forecasts a global EO market that by 2030 is estimated to deliver $3.8 trillion in cumulative benefit, US dollars, per year, $700 billion directly and $315 billion in potential value just in the Asia-Pacific area. That's growing by about 184% over the next six years, and that, that 315 billion is actually double the size of Europe in terms of potential value. For Australia, an ASIL Allen uh, report predicted that satellite land imaging alone, land and coast imaging alone, was estimated to directly contribute 7.5 billion to our economy by 2025. The report also estimates that Earth observation insights help reduce greenhouse gas emissions by two gigatons annually. So that's actually about 4% of global greenhouse gas emissions. And if we just kind of take that back one step further and have a look at two gigatons, what does that actually translate to? It's a 276 million cars per year on the roads. That's a lot of cars just in Australia, and it was very unscientific, but I did Google search this, um, we have 22 million cars on our roads. So if Earth observation is contributing to reducing greenhouse gas emissions by two gigatons and 276 million tonnes, we've only got 22, um, 22 million cars on our roads here. So quite significant, quite a startling statistics in, in terms of, of application and use there. 
Space capabilities are critical enablers of Australia's national policy agendas. In terms of two key Australian government priorities supported by EO, I'd like to just highlight our net zero emissions by 2050 policy by providing crucial data to protect and enhance natural carbon sinks and absorbers, such as forests and wetlands, and we have two products that cover that, which play a key role in balancing carbon emissions. The second, our Nature Positive Plan, um, EO provides critical data for conservation planning, habitat restoration, and ensuring that development activities do not compromise environmental protection goals this is really vital for halting and reversing biodiversity loss. EO also supports disaster risk reduction and management policies and the management of our waterways. And I know our DEA water bodies product is being used by MDBA to be able to monitor compliance um, in implementing the Murray-Darling Basin Plan. So, so very important there. Uh, we also support the Australian National Science and Research priorities, particularly those areas that are focused on forecasting ecosystems and monitoring our environment. And we can see that space-based capabilities are really inextricably linked um, to our science priorities and, and monitoring our ecosystem and environmental health. By providing critical data and insights, EO also supports the implementation of international frameworks the United Nations Sustainable Development Goals, the Sendai Framework, and the Paris Agreement on Climate Change. This is in addition to other multilateral environmental agreements uh, related to climate change, desertification, biodiversity loss, and ocean health. So Earth observation is a key enabler um, for our economy, environment, and also delivery of our national policy priorities. So now let's get to the good stuff. Let's have a look at some of our products. Uh, the first I'd like to highlight is that monitoring the movement of our coastlines is really critical. More than 85% of Australia's population lives within 50 kilometres of the coast. Climate change is driving an increase in extreme weather events with rising sea levels and more frequent storms. This affects coastal erosion and impacts both natural landscapes and human-made structures. DEA Coastlines allows users to identify and analyse patterns of coastline change across our vast 33,000 kilometre coastline, identifying coastal change hotspots, rates of change and annual uh, shorelines. DA Coastlines tracks and compares shoreline trends since 1988 to inform both strategic national reporting right down to local management scales, <coughs> informing protective measures, risk assessments and monitoring of interventions. Another uh, coastal product developed by our scientists here at Geoscience Australia is Digital uh, Earth Australia Intertidal. This product offers annual continental scale elevation for Australia's exposed tidal zone. That's the area between high and low water at 10 metre resolution. It allows us to monitor dynamic coastal regions, to reveal insights into the ever changing tidal zone. Uh, it supports the mapping and modelling of habitats of coastal fauna by integrating with ecological and migratory species modelling. For example, it aids in understanding the changing extents and availabilities of habitats, such as foraging grounds for endangered species like migratory shorebirds. Beyond coastal management, DEA intertidal also can be integrated with the existing topographic and bathymetric data to seamlessly map the coastal zone's elevation. Moving inland, Digital Earth Australia land cover provides a comprehensive view of how Australia's landscapes, so how our land, vegetation and water bodies have evolved over the last 30 years. Land cover data is crucial for supporting sustainable practices across multiple sectors. It helps in managing farming practices, monitoring water resources, preventing soil erosion, and overseeing forest management, just to name a few. 
With over 80 descriptive land cover classes, this product offers an extensive view of Australia's land transformations over the last three decades, revealing long-term changes and trends that aid in analysis. For example, we can measure desertification across our, our large and vast uh, continent over the last 30 years. Water bodies, including lakes, dams and rivers, are vital for agriculture, emergency response and maintaining ecological balance, among other applications. DEA Water Bodies provides up-to-date information about all available water sources across our continent. Um, at last count, I think it's about 300,000 water bodies across our vast continent. So that's quite extraordinary in terms of this capability. And it can track uh, those water bodies, the extent, how much water is in it uh, over the last 30 years. The blue hatched outline indicates water bodies and the rainbow coloured areas represent the frequency of water observations throughout the year. It enhances the management of water resources by also providing detailed charts that you can see at the bottom of the slide here of water extent variations over time. Utilising data from 1988 to present, DEA Water Bodies offers a historical perspective of water extent change across Australia. This long-term data set is crucial for understanding how water bodies evolve and how they respond to climatic and environmental changes. It also has real-time application use as well. For example, we've worked very closely with the National Aerial Firefighting Centre who can leverage water bodies in their planning tools and planning operations for aerial firefighting operations by identifying fresh water sources for water tankers, the big aerial water tankers to refuel, or maybe it's rewater, maybe that's the right term I should be using there. Um, but it does have strategic monitoring capabilities right through at a continental scale uh, to local kind of tactical applications, as you can hear there. On the same theme of emergency management, monitoring bushfire threats is crucial for effective emergency response and community safety. Geoscience Australia's DEA hotspots allows users to identify potential fire locations every 10 minutes by detecting areas of unusually high temperature, which then indicates possible threats to communities and property. DEA hotspots leverages satellite sensors to detect and map hotspots with colour coding indicating the, recent, uh, the recency of observations, so where it's red, it's most recent, uh, but also it gives confidence levels as well, so if it's large, there is higher confidence. Um, updated every 10 minutes, the system ensures near real-time monitoring of potential bushfires as well as comprehensive analysis of fire trends over time. Um, just out of interest, during the Black Summer bushfires of 2019-20, uh, there was a 200,000% increase um, in the usage of our DEA hotspot service with 1.8 million sessions from almost 500,000 users and it was a really broad range of users as well. Our second um, uh, bushfire product, D Digital Earth Australia's Burnt Area Surfaces, uh, Services, offer insights into the scale and impact of bushfires by mapping recent bushfire events and burnt areas within the landscape. It highlights changes caused by bushfires and provides insights into landscape scale impacts. I'd like to highlight that both DEA hotspots and our burnt area near real-time services, they're not to be used for safety of life decisions. Um, I understand they're operational, 10 minutes, um, but they're not to be used for, for safety of life decisions. With an overview of some of our DEA products, I'd also like to now extend and take a step into industry sectors use of earth observations. Um, EO supports a really broad range of industry sectors. In fact, most space-based capabilities you could describe as ubiquitous in that they support a really broad range of sectors and that's the same case for positioning, navigation and timing. In the environment sector, EO supports environmental monitoring of vegetation health over time, 
ensuring compliance with environmental regulations and informing sustainable practices. In the mining sector, applications include the ability to assess environmental impact, track land restoration, and detect changes in soil and water conditions. The barest earth map in the top right provides a baseline for accurate site assessments. Earth observation also offers potential and substantial benefits in the insurance sector. For example, by providing detailed coastal information, it, it enhances risk assessment, claim validation and pricing accuracy. Moreover, it aids in disaster preparedness as well. Of note, the Insurance Council of Australia has recommended the use of DEA's coastlines to aid in informed assessments of the risk to assets and to identify opportunities to both adapt and protect vulnerable infrastructure on our coastlines. In the utility sector, EO aids resource management such as water and energy and effective monitoring of infrastructure. It supports hazard assessment and response, enabling quicker recovery from incidents such as bushfire. And finally, earth observation data is critical for urban planning and development. By providing detailed information on land use changes, urban expansion, natural hazards and environmental conditions, EO helps cities with sustainable growth, resilient infrastructure and efficient resource management, ultimately contributing to smarter, greener cities. All of these impactful EO applications are grounded in deep scientific capabilities. So let's turn to these next. With an archive of satellite land and coast imaging dating back 30 plus years to 1988, Geoscience Australia utilises advanced scientific tools and algorithms to correct, calibrate and validate our data so that each 10 to uh, so 10 to 30 metre pixel or square can be scientifically analysed over time. The image on the left um, is what we receive as raw data from the satellite and I'll just press play again if I can. Um, and you can see that uh, there's a lot of cloud cover in there and there's a lot of sun angles. Um, that are affecting uh, the image there. The right hand image is after we've processed it. Through our advanced scientific me uh, methods, we compare and correct imagery acquired at different times, seasons and geographic locations. We remove the effects of image perspective and relief. We remove the effects of water vapour, cloud cover, sun position, sense of view angle, surface slope, surface aspect. And we use drones in the field to scientifically validate our algorithms. This means that our scientifically corrected data can be con compared over time as the pixels in the same location has all the atmospheric and terrain effects removed and has been scientifically validated. The correction, calibration and validation um, of our earth observation data is one really important step in our earth observation supply chain. Our space-based capabilities and all space-based capabilities generally have three segments. So you have the space segment, you have a ground segment and you have an end user segment. For the space segment, we leverage two global land imaging satellite systems from the US and Europe with four satellites circling our globe at 27,000 kilometres per hour. So that's pretty fast. Um, for the ground segment, we have dishes and antennas in Alice Springs Ground Station that downlinks that data and we also receive it via internet. We also have two world leading open processing environments. I'd just like to call out our open data cube technology, uh, which has been implemented in over 50 countries globally. We have over 140 science algorithms and we do have our four drones to, um, to actually validate our data. So this is all about being able to curate, prepare and process our data. 
Once that's undertaken, then we can use that analysis ready data to generate new scientific products. Uh, some of those I've been through today. Uh, we generate 18 national science analysis products and of that we also produce uh, nine landscape products, uh, some of which I demonstrated earlier. For the end user segment, so who consumes this data, the services and the products, um, we freely and openly share over 12 petabytes of data across Australia and the, the region. You can imagine the compute and the cloud storage requirements that sit behind that level of data. Um, and we deliver that to over 50,000 annual users. I just want to note that this is actually growing by about a petabyte a, a year. Um, a petabyte of data is about 11,000 movies. So that's quite a lot of data. Um, and then on top of that, super excited, but with the new Landsat Next constellation, that's going to grow by 16 times. Uh, so we're going to be 16 petabytes of data by 20, 2030. So that's exciting in terms of the science, um, but obviously you can hear from that all of the good work that's undertaken by GA in our cloud environment, but also our compute environment to make it openly accessible. Um, I really hope you enjoyed learning about the EO aspects of our work and the applications, some of the capabilities. Um, I'm now going to move to part two. So I'm moving on to positioning, navigation and timing, which I'm also equally excited about. I'd just like to explore that a little further um, by asking you all a question. Um, how much have you used positioning, navigation and timing to this point today? in a day since you woke up this morning? Maybe a little, maybe a lot, maybe not at all. Um, what I would suggest is that you probably have used PNT quite a lot. It's deeply embedded into our daily lives. And I think there are very few of us who have not relied on PNT capabilities since waking up this morning. Um, whether this is from the alarm on your phone that woke you up, uh, whether that's the apps that you use for your morning fitness routine, uh, navigated you here, or guided your rideshare, or the banking systems that allowed you to pay for your coffee this morning. Positioning, navigation and timing technologies are really ubiquitous. And again, they're interwoven into our everyday lives. Another question, um, did you know that? Reliable and accurate sentimental level positioning services are freely available to all Australians across all of Australia um, and its maritime zones right now. Um, being delivered by two really complementary projects. I've already mentioned some of these earlier. So we have our satellite based augmentation system, South Pan, which is delivering 35, 37 and a half centimetre positioning services across everywhere in Australia, including regional and remote. When it moves to full operating capability in 2028, we'll have it down to 10 centimetres, so quite extraordinary. It's a partnership with Toitu Te Whenua, Land Information New Zealand, so it naturally extends to New Zealand as well, and it's a great partnership. The availability of these services, 99.5% availability um, of our <coughs> precise positioning services from Southpan. The second complementary project is our national positioning infrastructure capability, uh, which is providing those three to five centimetre services in areas of mobile phone and internet coverage. Um, and a natural extension to that is our Ginan open source software tools and capabilities, um, which provide those positioning services. This is achieved with MPIC, it's achieved, we have 700 Commonwealth state and private sector ground reference stations across all of Australia, um, which take the satellite signals from our big GPS Galileo constellations and they correct and augment it. Um, through these two programs, we've taken positional accuracy in Australia over the last few years from five to 10 metres down to three to five centimetres. So quite an extraordinary capability gain there. Um, and now I'd like to step through uh, some of the impacts of precise positioning in terms of benefits to our economy, um, but also some pretty cool use cases of how we're seeing it leveraged now. Now for some stats across 10 sectors in the US economy, it's estimated that since GPS was opened up for civilian applications, 
$1.4 trillion of benefits have been generated, and that's just 10 industry sectors. And a more recent study found that 10% of the UK economy is directly supported by PNT uh, capabilities, so they have a critical link to PNT. Um, and if there was an outage, it would cost the UK around a billion dollars a day if there was a total disruption event. And in fact, a US study found the same, a billion US dollars a day um, if there was a critical disruption event to PNT. Um, so that's a lot of money. Um, I think in the context of Australia, we've run two independent economic studies of our positioning program. The, the three to five centimetre services is set to generate about half a billion dollars in the coming 19 years. And South Pan is expected to contribute 6.2 billion to the Australian economy over the next 30 years. Um, in my mind, it's the use cases that actually sit behind that number um, that are most impactful. These are estimates of economic benefits, and whilst um, we did trial in our satellite-based augmentation systems, and it was carefully modelled, um, these estimates, these economic estimates, are actually conservative. And they're conservative because we're talking about multi-decadal space-based programs. Um, they tend to focus, when we do economic modelling, tend to focus on right here, right now. How can we apply this? Um, perhaps it projects a little forward um, to some degree. But I think that the hardest thing to model is the things that we haven't seen yet. That is the innovative applications that can come from precise positioning to solve unique and contemporary opportunities in the decades to come. Um, so what are some of the use cases right now that were identified across our 10 centimetre and 3 to 5 centimetre positioning services? In the agriculture sector, precise positioning, um, there are broad applications of precise positioning. This example demonstrates how farmers can use precise positioning technology to enable tractors to be accurately guided along designated paths, maximising crop yields. This allows seeds to be sown precisely and water, fertiliser and herbicide to be directly applied over the plants, thereby reducing wastage. Um, that also has environmental benefits too. There's less risk of chemicals entering waterways and degrading water quality. And by following the same wheel tracks, it means there's less damage to soil. Precise positioning also allows some really amazing capabilities in terms of livestock management. And I'm not allowed to have a personal favourite again. Um, for example, uh, reduced livestock loss through the deployment of low cost on animal positioning devices that monitors and controls the location and movement of grazing animals. Quite extraordinary. So this is really important in two ways. I just want to share two examples here. Um, the first, it enables monitoring of animal behaviour in real time during predation events. Um, this is particularly relevant for sheep. So if sheep are in a predation event, they run in circles. So it will notify, it's like a real-time alert of a predation event uh, for farmers. The second, it monitors individual animal movement. Uh, and we know that sick animals generally don't move around a lot. Um, they're inactive and they tend to isolate. So that provides a really early indication of illness and by natural extension as well, it can assist in identifying when cows are having difficulty giving birth as well. Uh, research indicates that disease-related issues cost the beef sector alone 941 million per annum. Um, and in a recent, I had a really great recent engagement when I was at the Australian Space Forum with an agricultural specialist that identified that for large farms, our big farms here in Australia, uh, most managers expect a 15% livestock loss annually. So naturally that extends to uh, financial implications of our big farms and the flow on effect of cost of living and, and the, the cost of, of beef in the market. 
In the resource sector, um, uh, positioning technology plays a really vital role um, in all activities along the production chain from site surveying to extracting and exporting deposits. In this example, precise positioning of haul trucks allows mining operators to safely identify the location of trucks at any points in time. The real-time monitoring of equipment and personnel makes operations more efficient. Um, a really great example as well is smart geofencing technology that actually locates the equipment, locates personnel and sets up warnings if they come in close proximity to each other. So the natural extension is on-site workplace health and safety and using really smart technology there too. And you can see an example just at the end there. Precise positioning also enables really smart healthcare um, and enhanced mobility. Um, there was a really interesting demonstrator project that was undertaken that trialled um, how positioning can support visually impaired Australians to carry out daily activities. In the trial, positioning enabled assistive technology such as wearables, uh, like a wristband or a belt or canes. They were actually proven to track a four metre path around the user to be able to detect obstacles and locations. And by using a haptic belt that speaks to you, it meant that um, visually impaired um, Australians could navigate complex urban areas more safely, reducing trips and falls and so forth. Um, but it also assisted with catching public transport and letting you know, you know key cafe locations and so forth. Uh, so quite extraordinary. Uh, precise positioning also enables environmental monitoring, for example by CSIRO, who use our positioning services to monitor water levels, by the Bureau of Meteorology, this is a super cool one, to track the precise location of their ozone measurement balloons. So by putting our Ginan software in a box, on the balloon, it flies up to 30,000 kilometres. It's a really low cost example um, of precise positioning supporting our bond partners. And it's also used by the Australian Institute of Marine Sciences uncrewed platforms that conduct routine marine observations. We also can use precise positioning to map cultural heritage sites and we worked with the Australian Cultural Heritage Management Area who use SouthPan um, to leverage our 37 and a half centimetre services uh, for field survey of cultural heritage sites. Um, importantly, this is in areas with limited mobile phone coverage in regional remote areas and current standalone GPS just does not provide the sub-metre accuracy to meet state and territory legislative requirements. And so South Pan trial demonstrated that at 37 and a half centimetre accuracy, you can do this as a low cost um, solution using the right equipment set. Just a couple others. This is another exciting example. Um, in the robotics sector, our three to five centimetre MPIC Ginan services are being used by tiny, tiny mobile robots um, that actually use our precise positioning to mark sports fields and draw custom logos. Obviously, this Im improves efficiency for athletic directors, groundskeepers and facility managers. Um, this is just one example of where we're working in partnership with TMR and Aptella. Uh, to be able to leverage precise positioning for field robotics. I think I've, there's quite a number of examples there of our three to five to 10 metre services and the broad sectors that, that our precise positioning supports. I'd now like to just take a little moment to talk about some of our science and our capabilities. Geoscience Australia's Positioning Australia program supports Australian government, industry and research through the definition of accurate and reliable positioning foundations for location information in Australia and our region. We use scientific knowledge, technology and institutional partnerships and relationships to act as the national authority on position ver verification <coughs> but also to lead uh, civilian position navigate, positioning, navigation and uh, timing in government. 
We provide key positioning capabilities that deliver reliable, accurate, nationally consistent and openly accessible sub-metre positioning uh, capabilities across all of Australia's uh, land and maritime zones. In terms of our science, if I just go back to EO, space, gro uh, space ground and end user segment, uh, we leverage four global and two regional satellite systems, including the United States GPS system, uh, sending positional signals to Earth. We operate through our South Pan capability, two uplink and downlink facilities to satellites. Uh, and we are working, we have one uh, satellite in geostationary orbit, like very high Earth orbit, uh, that takes corrected signals and transmits them down. And that gives us a 37 and a half centimetre um, positioning that we receive um, across Australia now. On the ground, we operate key ge geodetic and positioning infrastructure. So we've got five geodetic um, observatories. We have 15 absolute gravity ground station, and that really goes to our fundamental role um, supply, uh, providing national geodesy foundations. These key observatories tell us about how the Earth is positioned and changes uh, to its shape and orientation. As part of our MPIC program, Geoscience Australia operates 235 GNSS re uh, reference stations. Uh, so those reference stations take the GPS and you know, Galileo and other big satellite constellations and correct it based on a very known application of that ground station. So really fundamental uh, infrastructure. This results in real-time data positioning stream that utilise a network of over a thousand regional uh, continuously operating reference stations or cores that correct the signals, as I mentioned, from global navigation satellite systems such as GPS and Galileo. And we provide our positioning services and analysis through our Australian GNSS analysis software suite called GINAN. GA utilises this data to provide data and analysis products um, to enable positioning uh, in Australia and globally, supporting domestic positioning needs as well as enabling global satellite operations and allowing the accurate definition of coordinates for ports, points on the Earth's surface uh, in a consistent manner. And that just goes back to the Australian landmass is moving seven centimetres northeast per year, so the geodetic foundations. In terms of end users, we've got 225,000 uh, positioning reports that are produced each year, uh, and that relates to, uh, to our reference frame. Uh, we have 20,000 active subscriptions uh, to our three to five centimetre positioning services across 96% of mobile phone coverage area. Um, I just make a note there, 20,000 active connections, one connection, uh, one company can use one connection to then provide additional uh, positioning services. So it may be that one company is actually servicing another thousand or 10,000 users as well. So quite an extensive network of use there. And just a final point, um, our service level agreement on our South Pan capability, 30, 37 and a half centimetre positioning services across all of Australia, down from five to 10 metres a couple of years ago. So that is our positioning, navigation and timing capability, uh, just some applications, very broad and diverse use, uh, a real pleasure to represent both our EO and PNT aspects of our work. Um, I would just like to talk a little about how these might come together. Just a couple of quick slides uh, in terms of where we might want to go into the future. Uh, so the first example, just I think right now uh, there's a current example where space and spatial capabilities are already working together. If we think of an incident control room for any major natural disaster, it will inevitably be consulting a common operating picture that brings together live feeds of all sorts of different information. Um, that can include live centimetre level positioning at the current location of SES teams, uh, satellite land imaging at flood extents, as well as key foundational features such as hospitals, schools and emergency services, bringing together space and spatial information in real time to aid decision making and operations. 
Maybe a more futuristic example is that we envisage that Geoscience Australia's data and platforms will enable new, innovative and integrated solutions. For example, a digital farm where livestock are fitted with low-cost tracking devices, allowing health and location monitoring. Similarly, daily satellite land imaging is providing biomass indicators and water levels. Uh, geospatial data that when combined with precise positioning enables autonomous on-farm vehicles. And then of course, integration with IoT. So sensors in feed and water troughs, all enabled, all consumed together um, on one smart app, app on our farmer's phone, iPhone, uh, you know, a desktop or, or, um, or tablet. Um, so it's really about envisaging a future where we can actually integrate all of our space and spatial capabilities to generate new solutions uh, that answer key questions um, and create a, a, a more prosperous um, and uh, productive way of approaching a uh, whole of industry sectors. So uh, new solutions, new insights through the integration of data is something that we're looking to uh, here at Geoscience Australia. Um, you know what, it's so science week uh, and I'd like to make a super uh, special call out to all of our amazing scientists, engineers, developers, technologists, analysts, contract project, program managers, our EAs, XOs, our accountants, our HR professors, there's just too many. <laughs> I think I'll stop there. Um, you all know who you are and you rock in outer space. Uh, so with that, Steve, um, thanks for your time everyone, really happy to take any questions. Wow, that was fabulous, Alison. I should have known that you would use a large part of that time because you're just so passionate about the work <laughs> and you have so much to share with everyone. And there's a lot packed in there and there's a big story to tell. What an amazing area. I'm about to, I think we might have time for just one or two questions. I'm gonna start off with one, just, okay. to, just because that then gives me a bit of time to fiddle with buttons and get people <laughs> sorted out. Alison. Amazing benefits, amazing work and productivity. But I know in your position, you also have to manage you know, future challenges and think, mm -hmm. you know, what, what lies ahead? If there was one future challenge that you'd, that you'd be happy to share with everyone, what, what, what's, what's the one big one that, that comes up a lot for you? Yeah, I think it's, uh, it's a great question. I think the way I'd answer it maybe is twofold. So I think the largest challenge, one of the largest challenges that we face is climate change. And we have a really powerful story to tell, deep science that goes to the changes in our landscape. Uh, and my sense is uh, being able to come together with other Australian government agencies, industry and academia, um, to be able to integrate all of our data and actually perform predictions perform predictions so that we understand the shape of what the environment might look like in 10 years time and how do we actually move forward with predictive analytics, present preventative measures and then monitor whether we're adapting to that and having the outcomes we want. So climate change is a big challenge. Technically data deluge, there's a lot of data that's going to be coming down the pipeline a lot of compute that's required. So I think that that's, um, that's a key element too. Thanks. Yeah, yeah. Do we have a quick question from the room that anyone would like to raise? No? Yes. Uh, well, that's, that's fascinating. Thank you very much. Just interested about solar weather events, flares, etc. How would that impact? Okay, so we've just had a question about um, space weather, solar flares and so forth and how that might affect things. Awesome. That's a great question and I'm sure our very clever engineers and scientists be able to respond so I'll respond as best I can. I mean when we've got satellites circling the earth and you've got solar flare events and obviously there's a necessity in being able to manage those in terms of delivery of services because it will impact it will impact our south pan signals coming from space uh, through the ionosphere. Um, equally, satellites in space are also uh, 
at threat of, ma of major space weather events. And so it's just being aware of that and being able to plan and mitigate that risk. And then finally, it's the impact in terms of end data usage and, and the resultant data of the satellite at that point in time. It's a very generic way of talking about it, but absolutely it's fundamentally part of something that we've considered for South Penn in particular. Geoscience Australia will have two payloads on satellites in high Earth orbit, um, and so that we've had to be very, very careful about understanding what the impact of space weather events are, what the risks are, and how we mitigate those, even to the point where we would need to notify end users that our South Penn signals are down at any point in time. So I love that question, really great. Um, maybe some of the engineering and the science, I know we've got really clever engineers, come and have a chat to us, thank you. Yeah, no, terrific. Um, we're actually getting tight for time, so I won't actually go to online questions. I think we've, we've probably used up a lot of the time there. I just thought of one other thing about the space weather and PNT, especially is all of the mobile phone users that are taking photos of the auroras and posting yeah. them online. Yeah. The, uh, just the amazing use that we're seeing there. Hey, you can hardly look at social media without seeing an amazing aurora photo at the moment. Terrific. Thank you very much. Hey, let's all join again in thanking Alison for a fantastic Earth Science Week seminar. Well done, Alison. Thank you.